conservation of angular momentum. If while I'm spinning it, what would happen if I then turned it over like this? Uh, you see, this way is spinning clockwise. And when I turn it over, it's now going counterclockwise. So to have a total angular momentum of zero, what would I have to do? I would have to change from going counterclockwise to clockwise. Watch. I'll turn it over after I make one revolution. All right, so I'm going to start. Uh, me and the wheel have no angular momentum. Now I give it clockwise, so I have counterclockwise. And when I make one revolution, I'm going to turn it over. <coughs> and it's going to be going counterclockwise. And I'm going to be going clockwise. I'll turn it back this way. It goes clockwise. And I go counterclockwise. Oh, I'll turn it the other way. And I'll go back and forth. And so our total angular momentum is zero. Uh, you can see that when you ride a bike. If you've ever ridden a bike, you can take advantage of this angular momentum. And so if this is the wheel turning, I'll just say the front wheel, but the back wheel is doing the same thing. And so it's going along. And here's where it gets maybe a little more complicated. If you're looking above from above, you wouldn't see any spinning. You would be just looking down on the, the wheel and the wheel would just be spinning like this. But if you're riding your bike and you want to turn to the right, don't you lean the bike to the right? Uh, because I would say this. As I'm riding my bike, so it looks like this, so here's the wheel, I'm riding along. Look from above, no angular momentum, no rotation. But if I lean the bike, and I'll exaggerate, and so I lean it here, the wheel would be spinning this way. So looking for above, I would see counterclockwise. So that means the other object, which is me and the bike, would have to go clockwise. We would go to the right. And so it would look something like this. We would be riding along like this. And as soon as we lean the bike, we would go clockwise because the wheel is going counterclockwise. And the same is true the other direction. If I go straight and I lean it to the left, the wheel then would be rotating clockwise and I would be going around counterclockwise. And of course, you can see that better if I actually then sit on the stool and, and try it instead of on the bike. And so if I give this a good spin, let's see, good spin. So I'm riding my bike going straight. Now I want to go to the right. I lean to the right. And I go straight. And then I lean to the left. Keep turning. And then I go straight. And I lean to the right. And so it's a conservation of angular momentum. And if you ever want to see something really silly, the winter retreat of the physics teachers of America is often in uh, uh, Colorado. And so we go skiing. But we go skiing without poles. We go with a wheel. And so we all get at the top of the hill. We all spin it. We put our skis and we just turn the wheel which turns our body and so it's a different type of skiing. Uh, it's really maybe not that fun, other than it's good, fun science, and it's worth trying once in a while here. Well, let me give you one or two more examples, but then we better wrap up this uh, chapter here. But I think one of the fun ones about angular momentum is the motorcycle stunt riders. Um, I don't know if you uh, like to watch it. My kids love to watch those uh, X Games stuff, and, uh, and the motorcycle ones just 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 fascinating me. It's amazing what these uh, riders can do. And one of the reasons it does is it usually comes down to angular momentum. Um, I also find like gymnastics and diving fascinating. Um, not quite as fascinating as the motorcycles, but let's just start there with, uh, say, gymnastics or diving. Uh, let's say 
that uh, uh, somebody is doing a, I'll do gymnastics, they're doing a routine on the floor. And a lot of these, you know, they run from corner to corner and then they do this amazing flip. They, they jump up and they flip three times and then land. Have you ever noticed the position they're in when they're spinning around so fast? Yeah, they tuck. See, they're in, if we come back to this step here, they pull in their whole body. They pull in their legs. They pull in their arms. And in order to have a big angular speed, they must have a small moment of inertia. And so the, those triple flips, I mean, just are amazing. I mean, you, yes, you've got to get very high to get the time to do it. But to get that fast spin, you've got to really tuck really tight. It's why the diving I like, and particularly the cliff diving, is a little more interesting because you have more time. And those guys, I'll take the cliff divers, you know, they'll, they'll stand, you know, 60 feet above the ocean here. And they're standing on the edge of the cliff. And then they'll lean off and... It, one of the ones I like the best is they, they lean off and they just are a slow rotation. Uh, and they have their arms up, they have their legs stretched, they're as tall as they can be, and they have this slow rotation. And since they're 60 foot up, they got quite a bit of time. And so they come all the way around until they get almost head down. And when they get there, then they quickly pull in their head and their body and their legs. And, and, and like I said here, this would then lower their rotational inertia so their speed would pick up. And so they're about halfway down and so they, so they go like this about half the distance down and then they pull in and they just spin really quick. And they do like two flips and then they're still above the water so then they open up again. And they open up when they're kind of in a standing position. They open up. And then they go slowly and then eventually psh, head into the water. And so it's really impressive. It's slow, quick, slow, splash. And so it's really uh, neat to see and they take advantage of that. And like I was saying, the motorcycle is a little more complicated, but much more interesting will do something like this. Uh, they'll go off of a jump and they'll go up on the ramp. Boom, and so the wheels are turning like this. And while they're in the air, they put on the brakes. Now, your first reaction might be, well, they're in the air. I mean, if you put on the brakes, the tires aren't hitting the ground. <laughs> they don't do anything. What, what does it matter if they put on the, on the brakes? And it's true the tires aren't on the ground. And so there is no interaction between the tires and the, and the road. So there's no forces in that sense. But there still is angular momentum. And so what happens is they go up and they apply the, the brakes. The wheel stops. And so the wheel doesn't have its angular momentum. And from your perspective, if I jump this way, the angular momentum would be in a counterclockwise direction. So if you stop that, where does that angular momentum go? Remember, it has to be conserved. And so it goes to the, the motorcycle and the rider. And so the rider goes like this. Boom! They put on the brakes. Now, it doesn't stop the motorcycle, but what it does is it makes the whole motorcycle begin to rotate in a clockwise direction. Uh, wait, clockwise? Counterclockwise, yeah. So you jump up, counterclockwise. And so the motorcycle and the rider do this. And it's really neat. They'll get all the way upside down. And then they'll go full throttle because now the back tire, now not the front tire doesn't have a chain hook to it so it doesn't uh, go anywhere. But when they go full throttle on that back tire, it starts to spin and it starts to spin far more than it was spinning before you applied the brakes. So in other words, you give the angular momentum not only back to the wheel, but you give it more than it had before. So that means you have to take it away from the, the rider. And so the, the rider then is upside down. You give it throttle. And if you give it a lot of throttle, then the bike starts to turn the other direction to make up for that large 
counterclockwise angular momentum in the wheel. So the rider has a clockwise angular momentum. And then they come around and then if everything works right, that's when they hit the ground. And so the jump looks like this. They go up, boom, apply brakes, oh, go upside down, hit throttle, turn around, boom, and nail the landing. Actually, if they don't nail the landing, it's good to watch too. I, I don't know why. It's kind of a sick part of me. But it's just really, really neat to, to see that finesse. There's another fun one I like to, to see the uh, riders do. And that's when they jump up and they go forward. And they're in the air. And instead of applying the brakes, they just take the handlebars and they crank it 90 degrees. And so again, looking from above, if you've got this wheel spinning like this, and again, from your perspective, it would be counterclockwise. From a, from a vertical perspective, it would be no spinning. And so if I do this, then this wheel is going in a clockwise direction. And so what happens is the back wheel comes up and moves the whole bike kind of in a flat position. So they call this a tabletop, spinning the other way. So if I'm riding the, the motorcycle here, and I do this with the handlebars while I'm in the air, my bike then goes like this. So, so I'm riding in the air, if you will, like, like, like this. I, I, I've turned the handlebars like this, my whole bike's gone up like this, uh, my, my feet are on the pegs, and I'm flying in a tabletop position, a flat position. And I do that for a while before I crank it back and then nail the landing. And so that's kind of a fun one to see here. Well, I'm really out of time, but I probably should do the simple one. Just the house cat. Don't try this with your cat at home. They, they don't like it, but they're really good at landing on their feet. If you take a cat and you take its back paws and its front paws, and so here's the back, and so here's the spine, here's the head, here's the front, Here's the back. First of all, the cat will probably be turning its head, looking down at the ground, going, okay, how much distance? And if you let it go, the cat will turn it around and land on its feet. And how does it do that? Well, there's two ways. The easiest way is for using its tail. And so what it will do is it will spin its tail in one direction, and that will make its body go the other direction. It'll rotate around, and when it gets its feet underneath it, it'll stop spinning its tail. So its body will stop spinning. In other words, the whole time it had a total angular momentum of zero. And then it will land on its feet. In fact, the best cat to see this is the cheetah, which don't touch a cheetah. But the cheetah has a hunting advantage that is easy to overlook. It spins its tail. Oh, watch this. If you imagine I'm an antelope <clears throat> and I see off in the distance this cheetah that's ready to attack me, knowing that that cheetah runs at 80 miles an hour and I can only run at, say, 30, 40 miles an hour, <clears throat> I know it's going to catch me. Okay. But I start to run anyways because the antelope knows that, hey, it's going to run so fast that when it gets close, I'm just going to make a turn. So if I'm the antelope running along and I see the cheetah coming at me, I'll keep an eye on it. It's catching me really fast. But when it gets really close, so here it comes, I'm going to make a quick turn to my right. And I'm hoping that as I turn to the right, now it's not going to be easy to make that quick turn. I've got to, I've got to take my uh, hooves and, and, and dig into the dirt and the mud, push, and hopefully the mud is strong enough to push, and I'll make that turn. But what I'm hoping is because the cheetah, who's going much, much faster, sees me turn, the cheetah's going to go, oh, i got to turn too, and they're going to push in the mud and the dirt. But since they're going faster, they would need a bigger force to make that turn. And the dirt and the mud's not going to be able to support that. And so as they, they push, the mud kind of gives out and the, and the cheetah can't make that turn. The cheetah kind of slides and maybe falls and rolls or, or, or maybe just gives up and just makes a bigger turn and, and, and misses the, the antelope together. That, that's what I'm kind of hoping if I'm the antelope. 
But what the antelope might be missing and what the cheetah has an advantage of is the cheetah knows as they get up to this antelope and it's going to dart off to the, to the right if they just use only their paws to push on the mud they're not going to get enough force to turn. So the attacking cheetah will spin its tail. See from looking from above the cheetah wants to go in a clockwise direction. And so as the cheetah is, uh, is approaching here and sees it goes off to the right, it'll lift its tail and spin it kind of like this uh, ball here. Where'd the ball go? Well, one of the ball, but I'll use the, the stopper here. But if I were to spin it counterclockwise, so if this was my, my tail, and I were to go, oh, that's clockwise from above, counterclockwise. So I spin my tail this way. That's going to help me, using conservation of angular momentum, to go clockwise. And then I don't have to push so hard on the mud. And then I won't slip. And then I will be able to follow that antelope. And then, of course, that would be my, my, my mill. And so that spinning tail. And the reason I picked the cheetah is, if you have a moment, do a quick Google search for a cheetah. A, Look at its tail. Its tail is ginormous. None of the cats, other than the cheetah, have a tail so incredibly long. In fact, it's so long that when they're walking, they, they have to lift it up. Otherwise, it drags on the ground. But that real long tail is its advantage for its spinning and using conservation of, of angular uh, momentum. Now, I'll do one more here. The, going back to the house cat, I said the house cat can turn over for two reasons. One was its tail, which led me to think about the, the, the cheetah. But maybe the hardest one to understand is something that doesn't have a tail. Uh, the bobcat. Believe it or not, it can still land on its feet. It's not easy. You have to be very flexible. Uh, humans can't do this. Our spine is not built with enough flexibility. But I'll illustrate it with these weights. And so you can see the rotation of it. Let me put a little mark on the weight. And so I'll put a black line on this weight. And a black line on this weight. Okay. So black line here, black line here. And let's pretend that these two weights, I'll put them together, is the spine of the cat. And you drop the cat. Now, this is not possible. The cat could not rotate its hind legs towards you. And at the same time, then it's front legs would rotate towards me. That would make the spine a 360 degree uh, twist in it. So that's not what the cat does. The cat doesn't just say I'll rotate my hind legs this way and my front legs the other way. They're gonna run out of room here and then the, the, the spine will, will stop it. But this is the cleverness of the cat. And so, here's the back legs, here's the front legs, I'll put black line down, black, back, black line down, okay. And so, what the cat will do is actually fold its black back legs towards the camera. Because the counter rotation would be its front legs fold towards the camera. So, it would look like that. Then, it can rotate its legs outward and the counter rotation would be to rotate these legs outward. And so as the back legs come over to here and the front legs come over to here, that's a conservation of angular momentum. Then as the back legs rotate out, the front legs rotate out and then it comes back to a straight and lands. But you got to fold in tight so that your rotation clockwise is matched by your rotation counterclockwise. 
And so I think the angular momentum, as I said, is really fascinating and definitely harder. And so that's why I uh, saved this one uh, for last. But rotational mechanics is a notch up. So good luck with this uh, chapter. Uh, it's time for me to just say, hey, we've done the best we can in this short amount of time. Uh, like I said, You'll see more of this and much more detail in Physics 121, but it's these eight chapters I want to get you uh, ready for. Now, earlier I said I would start Chapter 11, but uh, it's really time or almost time for a, a, a break. And so why don't I just say, well, we're a little more behind. Why don't we take our, our 20 minute break? And uh, that probably means definitely we won't finish chapter 11 today. So we'll still be behind. We've got some shorter chapters coming up, so we'll catch up. But this chapter is a long one and 11 is a long one, but, but much easier than this one. This, it's, it, and it's very different. And so I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a change. We've been doing mechanics for three weeks. Now now I'm ready to, to look at something else. We're going to get into the structure of material. So let me take a 20 minute break. Let me get some new stuff out here and then we'll continue this uh, in a little bit. Bye now.